Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Common Greenhouse Root Diseases, Causes, Symptoms, and Prevention, sponsored by Premier Tech. Today, we're going to talk about the most common root diseases growers encounter in the greenhouse and identify their causes and symptoms, as well as provide uh, strategies that can be used to help reduce the level of root disease encountered to manageable levels. I'm Robin Sitberg with Meister Media Worldwide, publisher of Greenhouse Grower Magazine, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. We'll have time for some questions at the end of the webinar. So if at any time during the presentation you'd like to ask a question, just type it in the question pane at the lower left part of your screen and click Submit. You can do this at any time during the webinar and we'll answer questions at the end. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Nathan Wallace Springer is Horticulture Specialist at Premier Tech. He has a Master of Science in Horticulture from Auburn University and a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Science from the University of Florida, along with minors in Natural Resource and Environment Law and Environmental Horticulture. Over the last few years, he's acquired a great deal of knowledge regarding hydroponic and aquaponic greenhouse crops, LED lighting, and plant nutrition. His goal at Premier Tech is to guide growers in edible market and floriculture crops through their challenges and help them to be successful. So now I'm pleased to turn it over to Nathan. Hello, good afternoon. I hope everyone is doing well this Thursday afternoon. Um, as Robin said, my name is Nathan Wallace Springer. Um, I am the horticulture specialist for Premier Tech for the southeastern United States. So I manage the states of Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and I just added on Maryland and Virginia. So today I will be going over common greenhouse root diseases, uh, talking about their causes, symptoms, and prevention. So without further ado, let's get on to the PowerPoint. Um, so I'm going to give you all a general overview of what I'm going to be talking about in this webinar. So I'm going to give you all an introduction to greenhouse root diseases. I'm going to talk about the most common greenhouse root diseases. Uh, particularly in this uh, webinar, I'm going to be focusing on Pythium, Phytophthora, Rhizoctonia, Theolovopsis, and Fusarium. I'm going to be talking about the primary causes of each one of these root diseases in your greenhouse, and then I'm going to be going over some management practices. So before we begin, we need to define what root disease is in order to address the issue. So I'm going to be defining root disease for this webinar as a disease affecting the root system or attacking a plant primarily through the root. Um, examples in this PowerPoint are going to include uh, umniceets and fungi. Um, and then we're going to talk about why does this matter in the first place. Um, and the reason why it matters is because Root diseases have a significant impact on global pr crop production. Um, they affect uh, vegetable growers, they affect medicinal growers, and they affect ornamental growers. They affect every single market segment. And as well, they cost uh, the global economy billions of dollars annually. Um, and it's also important to realize that when we talk about root diseases, uh, there is no universal response or control for all pathogens. What might work for uh, Pythium is not going to be treated the same way as Rhizoctonia. So we need to realize that uh, in order to grow and to learn and to improve our greenhouses. So I'm going to be giving you all an introduction into root diseases. So in order for root diseases to develop, uh, three conditions have to be met. And if we don't have these conditions, we aren't going to have root disease in our greenhouse. So the first condition that needs to be uh, present is there needs to be a susceptible host. If we don't have a susceptible host in our greenhouse, a plant that has been made uh, available and it is uh, susceptible to root disease, be that it's stressed in some way, uh, for example, overwatering or over fertilizing that plant, then we're not going to have root disease. The second condition that needs to be there is we need to have an appropriate pathogen present. If we don't have a, pro, uh, a pathogen in our greenhouse, then we aren't going to have root disease. We could have a susceptible host 
but not have root disease. We could kill that plant in other ways, but in order to get root di disease, we need to have a pathogen present. And the last condition is we needed a favorable environment to that pathogen. That pathogen needs to be able to grow, reproduce, and spread. Um, that's where it's going to be damaging to our greenhouses. So without these three conditions, we're not going to have root disease uh, progress. And this is what we often refer to as the root disease triangle. So I'm going to give you all, I wanted to give you all a little bit of a diagram to understand the root disease triangle. So first, we need that susceptible uh, plant. If we don't have a plant that is susceptible in some way, we cannot have root disease. If we don't have a pathogen available in that greenhouse, um, the pathogens that I'm going to be talking about today are going to be Pythium, Phytophthora, Rhizoctonia, Theolovopsis, and Fusarium. If we don't have one of those in our greenhouses, we're not going to have root disease. Um, and lastly, we need a favorable environment. Um, and environments that are favorable to root disease are going to be things like for airflow. If we don't have airflow in our greenhouses, then that plant layer is going to, the air is going to stay over those plants, and those plants can't transpire. So if we keep watering them, then eventually they're going to get stressed and make it more susceptible to uh, root disease. If we don't have, uh, uh, if we need an over, uh, sorry, we need to have suitable conditions and temperatures for root diseases to develop. For example, uh, Rhizoctonia prefers a uh, temperature range between 68 and 90. It, it, particularly in the 80s, uh, low 70s, that's going to be its ideal habitat. So we need to start thinking about, in terms of our greenhouses, where are these favorable environments and what can I do to uh, eliminate them for root disease? So before I start, I want to talk about root disease progression. Um, so our first picture here, we have an, a healthy plant for all intents and purposes. We do have a pathogen in that media. We can think of that as, you know, a raised bed, or we could think of that in terms of a pot. But for the purpose of this PowerPoint, it is a healthy plant nonetheless. However, let's say that we start overwatering it or we start over fertilizing it. Well, what we're really doing is we're adding plant stress. And what that's going to do is that's actually now going to create a favorable pathogen environment. So our pathogen now is able to grow. It's able to reproduce in that media. However, at this point, we could still say that we don't have root disease. Um, our plant is healthy. It's not targeting. We could correct this issue if we eliminate that plant stress. However, for the sake of argument, suppose that we don't eliminate that stress. And instead, we continue to overwater or we overfertilize. Well, now we're going to be adding more plant stress. And now at this point, we have a susceptible plant. This plant has now experienced root infection. Um, it has now created root lesions on that root, on that root system of our plant. The top part of our plant might not be showing any nutrient deficiencies at this point, but we have root disease now. We have uh, all three categories have been met. We have a susceptible host, we have a favorable environment, and we have the pathogen there in our system. At this point in our process, we could still save this plant potentially, uh, depending on what root disease organism it is. But if we continue, for the sake of argument, let's say that we continue what we've been doing, and we continue to over-fertilize or we over-water our plant. Well, at this point, we have now entered into an irreversible state. Um, we have now caused irreversible damage to our plant. Um, those uh, root infection has spread. The plant will likely experience more lesions along that plant. Um, and at this point, I really recommend that we need to start, you have to call the plant and you need to remove it from your greenhouse. Because at this point, treatment is not going to be possible uh, and you will start to see your plant experience uh, plant death 
at this point in time, the irreversible damage cannot be corrected by a fungicide application and your plant will die. And we really want to remove that plant from our environment at this point um, because we don't want spores to be produced. We don't want this to splash onto other plants. Um, and the thing about root disease progression is it only needs a few days to really progress or to start to form these environments. This is why in our greenhouses, we really need to be monitoring actively and looking for the conditions. We need to be searching and identifying potential causes or looking to see how our plants are doing. If we are, our plants are saturated and it is a cloudy day, we don't need to water our plants. We need to let them dry out first. Um, so we need to think about those in terms of root disease. So the five most common greenhouse root diseases are going to be Pythium, Phytophthora, Rhizoctonia, C. labiopsis, and Fusarium. And those are what I'm going to be talking about in this PowerPoint today. So Pythium. What is Pythium? Pythium is an NEC or water mold that thrives in wet conditions. So when you over fertilize or over water your plant, this uh, root disease loves those conditions. Currently, there have been shown to be over 200 different species of Pythium identified. And now, not all of those are necessarily harmful to plants, but a lot of them have already been shown to be toxic to plants. So that's going to be important to watch. So when we talk about Pythium, um, it is going to be excessive, uh, associated with those high levels of nutrient um, and or prolonged periods of saturated media. I also want to note now that depending on the type of media you use, you could be more susceptible to Pythium. And that's not something we typically think about, but if our media is not uh, drying out quickly for a uh, particular crop, well, now it's more susceptible to Pythium. If we are using really fine particles, such as in our germination mixes, we could see a little bit more root disease problems in those target areas if we're not actively monitoring and making sure that those plants are getting what they need and we're not giving them more than they need at that period of time. So how is this disease introduced into our greenhouses? Pythium is going to be primarily introduced either through some type of infected material or irrigation water. And when I talk about irrigation water, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about municipal water. I'm talking more from lakes or ponds, things that we've used like recaptured water. That could, be, uh, could contain Pythium that has been flowing in from the surrounding landscape. Um, we could also get Pythium in our greenhouses if, you know, we aren't using concrete floors. So if you are using some type of greenhouse that hasn't been floored off, um, even if you have gravel in there, Pythium can still bubble up through that gravel if it is overly wet and it's saturated and it's pushing upwards. So that's important to note because we're going to be talking about some prevention strategies later on about how to address Pythium. And Pythium in our greenhouses, it is really easy to identify um, because you're going to see a lot of stunted plant growth. Um, you might see brown roots that are going to look water-soaked. Um, you might see black leg, which is uh, when the base of that stem of your plant is going to start to turn black, and it will slowly grow up that. And we're also going to be see seeing plant death. So to give you a better understanding of what Pythium does, I'm going to show you some pictures show you all some pictures about this. So my first example, I want to show you some watermelon transplants. If you look on our right side of that picture, uh, this is how a water plant, uh, watermelon plant should look. We're going to have healthy roots. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but you will have uh, really our leaves there at the base of that plant are uh, coming up. They're healthy. They aren't wilted, they aren't drooping, there are no lesions on it. Um, that is an ideal transplant. However, if we look at our left side of our screen, we're going to see how Pythium has attacked that plant. We notice that our plant is wilting. 
Those leaves are not uh, pushing out at the top. Our plant roots are blackened. We're going to be experiencing less growth on this um, as well. We don't see any secondary roots. Um, that's not wrapping around that container. Here is an example of a hosta plant that has been infected with pythium. We can see that that has a really water-soaked root look to it. It is brown, and that plant is starting to wilt. It's starting to come over. The leaves are starting to be floppy. They aren't pushing outwards. This is an indication that we probably had pythium, and this is in the later stages of it. Here is an example of pythium in our poinsettia plants. So if we look at the left side of our screen, we notice that we have very healthy, uh, healthy roots. They're white, they are stretched. Um, but if we look to that, our right side of our screen, we see that our plant has experienced stunted growth. It's not that it's not growing, that pythium might not have fully infiltrated that plant yet, but it is an indication that we had uh, some type of root disease there. And when we look at it, we could tell that this is pythium. Um, so this is in the earlier stages of that. It has not progressed, but at this point, it could potentially be treatable, but it's probably best to call those plants and start to remove them from your greenhouses. We're not seeing the, the growth or the rooting, and this is going to uh, affect your ability to sell this plant later on. And I wanted to give you a couple of pictures of what pythium does to the roots of our plants. So in this poinsettia plant, we can see what's, uh, what we have sloughing off, which that basically means that we're getting rid of uh, unused or unwanted uh, tissue. So it, this is that, an example of that is when you take your roots in your hand, and I feel like all greenhouse growers have experienced black roots. If you were to pull it and it stretches off, that roots, that's going to be your sloughing off. And when we look at cotton here to the right side of your screen, that's going to be an example of damping off. So in the middle part of that, we have stem uh, tissue lesions um, at this point, but damping off, our, our transplants have pinched together. At this point, there is no saving or correcting the plant. Um, those uh, plants will die because water cannot be taken up into the plant. Essentially, the stem of the plant has pinched shut. It's damping off. It might feel a little bit mushy at times. At this point in time, um, it's best to remove. go ahead and remove those plants. And this can be typically is going to be happening through overwatering um, your plants. So our next root, greenhouse root disease is another umnice like Pythium, um, and this is going to be Phytophthora. However, unlike uh, Pythium, it's generally more aggressive, but it's less likely to be found in our greenhouses, um, which is good news for us, but it is very host specific. So this uh, root disease organism is going to be very difficult to suppress with any type of fungicides. Um, and one of the things about it is this, uh, this plant, or sorry, this root disease organism has been evolving and adapting for thousands upon millions of years. They can survive for great periods of time inside and outside of our greenhouse. So if we see this come into our greenhouse, um, chances are you, we could be experiencing this for several years down the road. And that doesn't just stick with Phytophthora, but for all root diseases. So the way that Phytophthora is primarily spread in our greenhouses or introduced into our greenhouses is through some type of plant material or irrigation water. Um, again, if we pump in water from a retention pond or our recapture system, that could potentially have uh, Phytophthora picked in from water that is pulled into that. Um, likewise, this does produce spores. So if we are watering uh, overhead and we are splashing water, we could potentially release spores into other and surrounding plants as well. So some of the uh, symptoms of Phytophthora are going to be root and crown rot. Uh, we're going to see blackened lesions, a little bit of foliar blight, and or plant death. 
in contrast, it's not uh, in contrast to Pythium, it's not going to be as soggy of an appearance, but it still will be noticeable as root death and root rot. So on our left side of our screen, we're going to see uh, pepper plants. And if you look closely on the right uh, portion of that picture, we have black lesions forming on that plant. Our pepper plant for our peppers growing, it is not as ablong shape. We're going to see damaging to those plants. And the blight is very evident on that uh, top right corner of that picture. Once we see this plant drooping over like this, we probably it's time to start considering pulling it because we're going to be potentially infecting the surrounding plants at this point. With zucchini, this is one of the very first uh, instances of uh, crown rot. We can see that it is starting to target um, that zucchini plant in the direct center. Um, we can see that we are forming brownish black uh, lesions on that uh, the leaf of that plant, of that zucchini plant, as it stretches off. At this point, we could still potentially save that plant if we were to apply a fungicide dredge and go ahead and kill it, but I would definitely mark it to be pulled. We can see that our fruit is still appearing to be growing it healthy, but this is a plant that we would be marking um, if we didn't later on address this issue, uh, then this plant would be needing to be pulled from the greenhouse. This is a good example of phytophthora and soybean. So in terms of soybean, we can look at the right side of that picture of that stem and we can see that it is experiencing its darkened crown and stem rot. Um, we see the black and brownish lesions forming up that stem. Our roots though are not exactly like Pythium where it, it feels soggy. They can, you can still see that we're seeing root lesions. We're still seeing that they're infected. Um, they are black in spots, but we, if we go back to the other pictures, uh, they aren't white roots. They are, have a darkened appearance to them. And if you look closely on the stems of that, we're seeing cankers start to form as well. This is a time in which this crop needs to be pulled out of our greenhouses. And this is a, an example of cyclamen. Um, I wanted to show you all in a picture of root rot that's occurring. Um, it's not that soggy feeling that we saw out of uh, Pythium, but our plants and our root system, all of our roots are essentially dying or dead in this plant. Um, we do see a little bit of white remaining. Those are going to die soon. This plant, um, it's hard to see at the top edges of it, but this plant was already drooping over. It was experiencing other issues. Um, this is a good time to go ahead and pull this plant um, from your greenhouses. And my last example that I want to show you all from Phytophthora is going to be on spathophyllum. So if we look at our top part of this picture here, we're seeing that our plant roots are very healthy. They're long. Our plants, our leaves are very dark and green. This is a good crop. Um, they all look healthy. We're not experiencing any chlorosis, any issues or nutrient deficiencies in our plant. This is a good sign. In contrast to that, if we look at the bottom part of our picture, we're starting to see that our plants are droopy. We're starting to see yellowing of leaves. They might start to look like they're falling over. Um, our plant roots are, we can see that they have black, brown and black parts in them, and that's showing the lesions of the phytophthora already in our root system. Our roots are dying, they're starting to fall over, and the plants are slouching over. At this point, I would definitely go ahead and pull our plants in our greenhouses like this. That way that we're not potentially introducing this into other uh, crops in the area. Because again, once again, Phytophthora is uh, generally more host specific. It is a little bit harder to transmit than Pythium, but we still don't want to take that chance in our greenhouses. Moving on. Our third, our third root disease that we're going to be talking about today is going to be rhizoctonia. 
And this is going to be our first soil borne fungus. Um, it's different than what we've been talking about as our water molds. This is going to be coming from our soil. Um, and it primarily targets young greenhouse uh, plants and transplants that we are growing. So as I mentioned earlier, Rhizoctonia prefers uh, temperatures in the range of 68 to 90 degrees, but really loves a sweet spot of 75 to 86 degrees. Rhizoctonia is going to be uh, favoring uh, really dense canopies. Um, and it's going to be caused, uh, later on I will show you a couple pictures of its most common um, symptom, which is going to be web, uh, web light. So one of the ways that we can identify or narrow it down to Rhizoctonia is that it has these distinct brown reddish lesions forming on that plant stem at or just below the surface of the growing media. It is very distinct and you will see it in the pictures that I'm about to show you um, that it can be narrowed down to this. Um, and as that fungus develops, if we were in nursery or forestry, it would develop into forming really dark and deepen cankers on that stem. Um, commonly, you might uh, hear this, that we might have botrytis stem rot. It is commonly mistaken for that, but the good way to identify the difference is Rhizoctonia doesn't form spores. There's a lack of spore function, and it will usually lack the gray coloration to separate it um, between that and botrytis stem rot. Um, the primary way that we're going to be introducing this fungus into our greenhouse, though, is going to be due to some form of soil contamination. Um, we could, if we aren't actively uh, monitoring what we're bringing into our greenhouses, any type of soil residue could potentially track that into it. Likewise, if we're looking at under our benches and we don't have some type of covering on the ground, um, rocks can still, we can still bubble up uh, Rhizoctonia that is under that surface as well. So that's the potential spot in which we could get that into our plants. Um, it can also be transmitted by fungus gnats and shore flies. And I want to bring that out because, uh, bring that to your point of view because there are other insects that can bring this in as well. But these are going to be the primary ones. And if you see those in your greenhouses, well, once we get it there, if we have a plant that does have rhizoctonia, um, they can clearly transmit that throughout your entire greenhouse. So if we curb uh, our insects from being able to spread in our greenhouses, we could also lower the transmission rate of rhizoctonia in our greenhouse. And we talk about rhizoctonia, I want to point out plants like azalea, begonia, um, ferns, holly, and impatiens. Those are going to be some of the most common plants that Rhizoctonia target. Um, and some of the symptoms of Rhizoctonia are going to be damping off, crown and stem rot, web, uh, web blight, which is one of the ways that you can easily start to identify this plant compared to uh, Fusarium later on. If you see uh, brown and reddish lesions, but you also see web blight, you probably have Rhizoctonia. So web light is caused by the <clears throat> organism's hyphae forming, and they grow and they stretch. And it will start to uh, produce a webbing-like effect on your plant. <clears throat> as well as it also will have like a dry or shriveled appearance and can ultimately cause plant death. <clears throat> so I just want to show you a couple pictures of what Rhizoctonia looks like. So on our left side of our screen, we're going to see some Rhizoctonia uh, stem and leaf bl uh, blight forming. If we look really closely, it's hard to see in this photo, we actually have a little bit of web in between that pinching. This is a good indication of Rhizoctonia. We also have that media right there. It has it's darker in color, so it's a little bit damp and moist. This is a breeding ground for Rhizoctonia. When we look at poinsettia, if you look to the closely, real closely on the back side of the stem, we're going to start to see a blackening of it, and that's where our stem cankers are forming. Our plants are starting to droop. They're starting to fall over. Um, this is a, a good example of 
rise attorney at in poinsettia i just wanted to show you all another couple pictures this is what our website looks like in rise attorney so if we look at the left picture here we have our drooping leaves where our plant is starting to fall over it gives a wilted or uh disheveled appearance we can see as we look in the closely of that oasis cube this is the webbing that I'm talking about. This is the hyphae of the organism that it produces. It doesn't tra transmit as much through spores um, unless it is gone through long, long periods of time. Um, and if we look to our right side of our, our screen, we can see our Cami stiparis. This is going to be an example of web light. We can see that we have on that stem here, we have lesions. Um, it's produced a webbing in that. And again, Rhizoctonia loves dense canopies. Um, they like where it doesn't have a whole lot of airflow. For this disease, in order to reduce it, we really need to increase our spacing of our plants. We're going to, if we can space out our canopy diff, uh, a little bit, it promotes airflow and does reduce this disease, uh, root disease from occurring. But it will develop in our inner canopies that are the most closely stagnant air before going out, outwards. And I wanted to show you, this is what I meant by its distinct red lesions. So, for example, this is a picture of cucurbit, which is, uh, we can think of this as the squash family, things like squash uh, um, or cucumber. This is the red lesions that I'm talking on that base. In, in that uh, rooting. We can see that our roots are turning a distinct uh, red color. It's, oh, we don't have any white roots left on this plant. If we look at our soybean picture here to the right, it's a distinct red burnt orange color. We're not having our plants grow any types of roots. We can see that our, uh, our stems here at the midpoint of that picture, they have dampened off, they are closed shut, and those plants are essentially going to fall over and die at this point. So if we see this, um, this is a really telltale sign if we can see the red lesions with some type of web light, we can identify this as Rhizoctonia. Um, moving on to C. labiopsis. C. labiopsis is another soil-borne fungus um, but in contrast to uh, Rhizoctonia, it's going to be, it favors cool, wet soils, and it loves to have a pH greater than 6. Um, one of the ways that we can differentiate this from most uh, root diseases is it's also referred to as black root rot. And when I say black, it's very distinct black. Um, it's from, that black will come from the pathogen's reproductive spores, in that crop. So one of the things about uh, the labiopsis is occasionally it's mistaken because of an iron nutrient deficiency or t some type of chlorosis it causes. Um, and when a grower sees that, they see a widespread patch of uh, plants that are all chlorotic and they think, oh, well, I need to apply more fertilizer. I must have something went wrong. The injector was wrong. And next thing I know, they apply more fertilizer. Well, that fertilizer ends up actually killing the plant. It actually adds more harm to the plant. Um, and one of the things about C. labiopsis is it's only fo we can only focus on prevention. There are no curative fungicide drenches for C. labiopsis. So if we get this in our greenhouses, we have to call plants immediately. We do not want this to grow, reproduce, sporulate, or go out into our greenhouses. Because at that point, we're going to have a lot more problems to deal with if we don't find this early. And I'm gonna keep reiterating that through this PowerPoint and webinar that we need to focus on uh, prevention rather than reaction. Um, that's going to be the crux of our uh, root disease management strategies. So when we talk about Thela labiopsis, uh, this is going to be primarily introduced uh, into our greenhouses through some type of direct contact with the pathogen spores. 
It can be transmitted by insects, wind, and dust. But I'm going to highlight, again, fungus gnats and shore flies. If you've seen those in your greenhouses, plants that are very saturated in media also that have this, like, for example, if you're seeing a lot of algae in your plant surfaces, well, if your plant also has algae, it's probably due to an overwatering or over-fertilizing your plant. So your plant is likely stressed <clears throat> and a favorable environment to a pathogen. Now, if it does have that pathogen and there are insects in your greenhouse, well, those insects can then turn around and transmit that uh, to other, and they can take that disease, those spores to other plants, and, and that can result in additional harm um, in your greenhouses with additional plants getting affected. So the symptoms of the labiosis are going to include stunted growth, wilting, a really distinct chlorosis, black roots, and or plant death. So I want to give you all a couple pictures of what the labiosis might look like. This is a picture of digitalis with the labiosis. So we can note that we have distinct chlorosis occurring in the top of our leaves. Um, we are seeing the black roots. If we look at pans our pansies, um, this is that really distinct black coloring. Um, our roots have already been infected with this, and eventually our leaves are going to turn chlorotic at the top. This is a little bit caught a little bit early on. Um, the Leviopsis, the primary plants that we're going to be that are really prone to this are going to be things like our petunia. Calibracloa, vinca, and pansy. And you will definitely see this organism with these uh, crop types. And you will definitely see the chlorosis that I'm about to show you if you have this plant or have this root disease in your greenhouse. So this is a picture of chlorosis on a viola plant. We can see how we have a darkened black root system here at the top. Our plants have gone chlorotic. Um, and this will eventually start to take over the rest of this plant. If we look to our right side, my next picture, petunia, we can really start to see that chlorosis in those plants. Um, if I saw this on the outside, you know, and I didn't know much about it, and we just saw a picture of it, we might think, oh, well, this is just an obvious, you know, nutrient deficiency. I mean, we probably forgot to, like, add, you know, iron or maybe something happened. Um, when we go to hit that with more fertilizer, those plants end up dying because the labiopsis has already taken over that root system of that plant. And at that point, uh, it's producing spores. We need to go ahead and cull those plants and remove them from our greenhouse because if we don't, we're going to have more problems. So if you see this in just a section um, of your plants and everything is healthy but just a section, I would definitely start to look at those roots pull it, and if they are, pull it immediately because there is no fungicide drench that is going to work with the labiosis. We can only, again, focus on uh, preventative with this root disease. And our last root disease of this afternoon is going to be fusarium. Fusarium is a soil-borne fungus that also targets plant foliage and roots. Um, You'll see this in areas uh, where we have very high temperature and moisture and drainage is poor. Um, and this disease can be spread around from if a plant came in contact with another plant or if you, uh, for example, if you were to prune your plants and you're not applying a good sanitation practice between it, you could, in fact, go from plant to plant to plant or you could spread this around through splashing. So fusarium can really target mums. Um, are going to be one of our important crops, as well as tomatoes, peppers, our broccoli, uh, tobacco plants especially. Um, so fusarium, like the others on this list, it's going to be introduced, again, through some type of soil uh, residue. Um, and that could be contaminated equipment, things we've been outside. We could see this through uh, transplants as well. And in some cases, uh, this is, though be it rare, it can transmit through seed. Um, through commercial seed, you're probably not going to have a problem. Like I said, it's extremely rare. But I wanted to bring that to your attention, uh, that this can be transmitted through seed um, as well. So, again, this, this at the very start um, will appear as red lesions on that plant. 
but it's going to be very closely followed by root rot. And you're going to see a distinct wilting of that plant. So this is a good telltale sign to differentiate this from, uh, say, Rhizoctonia that had those red lesions we saw, but it's not going to have that wilt the same way you're going to see a fusarium wilt. So the main symptoms we're going to be looking at to identify fusarium are going to be crown rot, root rot, yellowing of that plant, a distinct wilting, and or plant death. So to give you all a couple uh, pictures of how fusarium looks, this is a fusarium in pepper plants. Um, you can see that it's going to have that distinct folding over and keeling over. Um, you'll notice that during the hottest times of the day is when it's going to show the most wilt, and it will recover slightly at night. Um, the, the leaves will start to turn yellow, um, but it's not always uniform, um, and eventually this will progress through to the entire plant because it does move. And this is an example of fusarium wilt in chrysanthemum. So if we see in that top right corner here, um, that's going to be where our root uh, wilting has started. We notice that we had something in it. We can see that we're starting to see, I know it's difficult in this uh, picture, but we're starting to see uh, a distinct yellowing of that leaves in that region. It's, at that moment in time, it's going to start moving uh, to the rest of that plant. Um, this could have been through a, a pot where we had multiple fusarium plants, or sorry, where we had multiple chrysanthemum plant, planted in it, and then one got uh, fusarium. But likely at this point, the whole pot is probably going to be infected at this point. So it is something to look for and identify to see if we need to remove this uh, from our greenhouses or from where we're growing. This is an example of fusarium wilt in tomato. This is in the final stages of fusarium's death. Um, we can notice that, again, that distinct wilting where everything in that plant has dropped over. Our plants are, in this case, our tomato fruit has problems on it. We can see foliar uh, blight on it. Um, and our plant is falling over. It's dying. The plant should have obviously been removed before it got to this condition. If you are growing tomato, be that in landscape or out in the field, definitely remove this plant because you're going to have problems around the surrounding plant. And when we look at fusarium, one of the ways that we can really identify it is we're going to see uh, vascular discoloration. So fusarium will actually move up the stem of that plant, and you will see uh, a darkening tissue. Um, the roots are, again, if we compare that back to, say, uh, Phytophthora or Pythium, they're not as dark, they're not as soggy. But you can definitely see that root rot and that, those root lesions on that plant spreading. Um, and then our, my last picture for fusarium is going to be a picture of crown rot in dianthus. So this is going to be in the head of the plant. We can see that we have a darkening of those stems. Um, and at this point, the plant is going to need to be pulled. Um, if we leave it and think that we're going to correct it, chances are it's going to be, this plant is going to be causing more harm because if we're watering it, um, spores could spread. If we have any type of insects that could be transmitted. So I would go ahead and remove this plant at this time. So bringing it all together, I want to talk about root disease management. Um, this is going to be talking about how, you know, we have a problem. Organisms have this evolved for millions of years in these harsh conditions. So now what we're doing is we're giving them a favorable environment in our greenhouses. And if we don't correct that, they are going to have long-term issues. So our objective when we talk about root disease management is we need to reduce the level of this disease uh, to uh, economic viable parts. So we need to reduce this to the economic damage stressful uh, that's going to cause a yield or quality loss. So now that we've talked about root disease and we've given an introduction of what it is, how it progresses, and we've gone through the five uh, most common diseases that we're going to see in our greenhouses, what are our solutions? Well, our first solution is we need to take uh, steps and be proactive <clears throat> rather than reactive. Um, we need to address the, the overlying underlying conditions 
that are affecting our greenhouses. Um, we need to implement proper greenhouse sanitation. So this is, and I stress, can't stress this enough, this is, should be thought about as our first line of defense to managing root diseases. Um, we need to have good management. So that can be like dumpsters farther away from our greenhouses where we have all of our debris. Um, go through and cleaning our, our, our trays, our benches, of any and all algae during the off season. We can think about this as adding trash cans uh, that have live debris, but we need to empty those uh, once a day if we have any live debris because we don't want to get any type of insect in there where we could spread. And then we need to think about identifying environmental conditions that favor root disease um, and consider a growing media that has biological additives. And that's what I'm going to be talking about next. So when I talk about bio additives and growing media, um, these are what are we add to before the onset of disease. So an example of this is going to be promix biofungicides. So in terms of promix and Premier Tech, we use two types of uh, bacteria in our media that help with protecting against Pythium, Fusarium, and Rhizoctonia. And those are Bacillus pumilus and Bacillus subtilis. Um, and these can be compatible to or comparable to uh, chemical controls. Um, everything that's pretty much on the market now is able to be used in conjunction with them, uh, except for if you're using a copper uh, fungicide or some type of application, I would really need to talk more because those uh, might not work the best with our, our biofungicides, but they are able to be used. If you have a fungicide trench and you need to apply it, our bacteria in there are going to be safe against that. However, I want to stress that these are preventative and not uh, curative. Um, if they've already been in the system, um, well, you're not going to protect your plants at this point. Um, but I want to say that this offers one more tool in our IPM tool bag. So uh, this is a close-up picture of Bacillus uh, pumilus, and we can see that we're, uh, it causes root hair proliferation. We can see in that surrounding system that what it does is it releases uh, uh, into the media uh, you can see auxins that uh, will actually curb uh, Pythium, Fusarium, and Rhizoctonia from being able to grow um, as well. So lastly, what are we going to do about this? So I'm going to give you my eight prevent, uh, prevention tips for managing uh, greenhouse root diseases. So my first one is going to be identify the critical control points in your greenhouse. Identify the areas in which these are likely to occur or what is causing them. We need to know if we have a high humidity problem, uh, see about addressing this. If we have uh, a problem with algae, we need to address that. We need to, we need to identify the sections that are most likely to attract root disease. My next prevention tip is going to be establish good sanitation practices. And what I mean by this is, Sanitize tools after use. If you're going from cutting to cutting, dip them in a sodium hypochlorinate solution. I cannot tell you how many times I've walked into a greenhouse and see watering nozzles on the floor. If we take away nothing from the rest of today, please keep your watering nozzles off the floor because those are areas that these bacteria, or sorry, these fungi and uh, water molds love. They can easily get moved from that, and then you water, and now it's in your plants. Another prevention tip that I like to fo focus on preaching is inspect incoming plant material for any signs of symptoms of disease. If you're able to have a section in your greenhouse that you can just monitor or a uh, transition greenhouse, that is ideal. Just the place that you can bring these in to see as they grow a little bit, does this have a problem before I introduce this into my main greenhouse? Um, that will curb a lot of the problems later on that you might face. My fourth prevention tip is going to be reducing the excess humidity in our greenhouse. Um, we have seen that Rhizoctonia and others love when we have low airflow, soggy conditions um, in our media. 
if we eliminate that, well, now we are going to be reducing those diseases that we may face. Um, my fifth tip is I know it's really hard. I'm, I know that this is not easy to do, but avoid overwatering and over-fertilizing. And by that, I mean we need to let that growing media that dry between waterings. Uh, you can pick up the pot and see if it's heavy. Do not, you might not need to irrigate on a cloudy day if our media looks really damp. Um, those are times that if we can curb our overwatering and our over fertilization, we can drastically reduce uh, quite majority of the root diseases we see in our greenhouses. Number six, it's not really, uh, it's a good sanitation practices for greenhouses in general, but eliminating insects and weeds in our greenhouses. Because as I've talked about throughout this webinar, these insects have the ability to transmit these diseases. Not only do they cause damage to our plants in general, but they also can transmit other things that are going to harm our plants. So if we eliminate them, we're going to be doing good. Number seven, I want to talk about using a growing media that is ideal for the crop environment. Um, if we're not using a growing media that is best suited for that plant or one that is drying out in an appropriate manner, um, root diseases could progress. So, for example, do not use a plug mix and grow that into a six-inch pot. There are better media for that. And, yes, I have seen people try to do that before, and they'll just take it one way around. Know what you're using and know why you're using it. And then my last tip of the day is I want to stress avoid reusing pots. I know that right now we're seeing supply chain issues because by the pandemic, I know that it's very hard. Um, if you're not able to, uh, you, and you know, if you have to reuse pots, make sure you're sanitizing them sufficiently. Make sure you're eliminating everything. And if you see a pot that had a disease in it, um, do not reuse that pot. Throw it out. You are better off because then you're looking at the next harvest. The way that you, the best way to manage disease is to take react like action and be proactive beforehand this is not something that should be uh wait until we get into the season to worry about we should be thinking about this a month or so out from the next season these are things that we need to be focusing on and if you do that um you will drastically reduce uh your root diseases in your greenhouse and with that i am done um that is the end of my webinar do we have any questions? Yes, we do. <laughs> this is Robin. And thank you, Nathan, for a really informative overview of root diseases. Um, and yes, we have a number of questions coming in. So I'm going to start with the first one, which is, what are the main species that Phytophthora can affect? Um, what was that? Uh, what are the main can, uh, species? Attack? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I'm so sorry. I think I'm, I misspoke on, or saying on that. When we talk about uh, Phytophthora, the main species that we can be looking at are things like Andromeda, things like Azalea uh, slash Rhododendron. We might see it in Camellias, uh, Laurel, or uh, Verbena. Those are going to be some of the more prone uh, plants that are available, that, that root disease is going to target. And I think I didn't say that with Pythium. But with Pythium, um, it can target any disease. There is no plant on Earth that is 100% uh, resistant or, uh, to Pythium. Um, but the main species that we're going to be looking at with Pythium is going to be chrysanthemums, things like Dianthus, Lilium, Viola. Things in those families are going to be a little bit more prone to Pythium attack. Okay. All right, our next question is, could umycetes be sourced from municipal water sources. Um, so I know they can come from local. Yes, go ahead. That is an excellent question. Um, typically, we don't see a whole lot of Pythium resulting from municipal water sources. So if you have Pythium in your greenhouses and you are using city water, 
chances are you introduced that Pythium in through another form of contamination, be that like transplants that you might have brought in, uh, some type of soil contamination, or maybe if your greenhouse doesn't have proper pouring, those could be uh, where you would likely introduce Pythium into your greenhouse. Okay. There's a related question also to do with Pythium. I use captured rainwater and water that I draw up with a submergible pump from a creek on our property. What are your thoughts uh, with this water with respect to what you're touching on with Pythium? So, so captured rainwater. So if you were using our captured rainwater, I would need to, that would be very system dependent. I would need to see, you know, where you're pulling that rainwater because I've seen different systems, uh, different capture systems. If it was completely isolated from, you know, the soil, it would be a little bit less likely. Um, but I would recommend, you know, sending off water testing too. You can test for it if you think that that is your source of pythium in your greenhouse. You could send it off to a virology lab or something like that to identify uh, if that is where your pythium is coming from. Um, but if, it, if your recapture system or your rainwater that you're capturing is in contact with your soil in any way, uh, you could be introducing pythium. So that's something to take into consideration. And she's also using uh, water from a submergible pump from a creek, so that would obviously not be. So isolated creeks from the can soil. definitely have pythium in it. I know that creeks slow down. Pythium can definitely come in through those methods. Um, I would definitely look or look to that being a potential source of pythium. If they're using it or drawing it in from a creek, you could definitely come into contact with pythium. And anywhere where you're drawing in from a surface water, that's going to be a transmission zone for Pythium. So if you are experiencing, you would definitely probably be more uh, prone to Pythium in that case. Okay. All right, our next question is, how does wilting a plant between watering um, affect root disease? How does wilting affect a plant? Um, yeah, between so, yeah, wilting, and I don't know if they're talking about wilting or drying the soil, but it's probably both. <laughs> One usually leads so to the other. So it's important to note, if your plant is wilted, um, I'm not saying that, you know, every wilting is uh, related through, say, fusarium wilt. I'm not, it's important to identify uh, the areas of our plant. So... I'm going to go back to uh, fusarium when I was talking about it. So when we talk about fusarium, um, yes, that it has a wilt associated with it, but it's also going to have other things with it. We're going to see red lesions. We're going to see problems in our plant that aren't just related to wilting. So if you were to pull up, uh, you can flip over the base of a pot. If your plant roots are all healthy white, and your plant is wilted, chances are you aren't watering your plant enough. Um, and in that case, you could just add water. But if you're starting to see a yellowing of the plant, you're starting to see uh, a little bit, like in this picture that I showed with uh, soybean, you'll see a vascular discoloration of those roots. If you're starting to see that and you're not seeing white, healthy roots, you could have a root disease organism. And in that case, that's when you would start to take other steps. Okay. All right. Um, boy, we've got a lot of questions. Um, this is, let's see, uh, someone is asking, uh, are there any kind of quick test kits we could run to try to detect what diseases we might have to avoid the delay of lab results? That is a good question, and I'd have to get back to you to know. So that's a little bit outside the, the scope of what I do, so I'm not entirely sure if there are or they're not. But I, would, I could definitely find out and see. But one of the most surefire ways is to send it to a lab to be analyzed. And that's going to tell you what is in it. Okay. Um, okay, someone is asking here, and I don't know the abbreviation here, but it says, in NFT hydroponics, would H2O2 kill all pathogens? And what percent is best if you're recirculating? Okay, so I actually, my background was in hydroponics and in aquaponics, so I can actually answer that. So in aquaponic systems, one of our biggest 
columns is is going could be potentially that um, if you are growing with that, you can use products such as Xerotol at the right rate. You can use there are applications. I don't really want to go into those because that's a little bit outside the scope of what I'm focusing on on preventative measures. But there are things that you can add to your water uh, that will kill or, or target organisms like that. Um, but you want to make sure you're applying them at the correct label and at the correct rate. Um, but yes, once they get into that system, due to the interconnected nature of NFT systems, you're going to see it spread throughout uh, your entire section of your NFT. Um, and if you are using that water to recirculate multiple channels, all of your channels could experience um, the same root disease. So it's important to identify that at the start if you're seeing that. Okay. All right. We have time for just one more question, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Um, it's, would you recommend uh, to do clear water instead of feeding to an infected plant after you treat it? Um, clear water as a transition period is fine. Um, if you were talking about a house plant, I don't think that that'd be, that would be problematic because typically houseplants are used in a, a potting media that has a long-term fertilizer. Um, so you don't always need to fertigate every single time. So if you have houseplants where this is infected uh, and you have been able to save that plant and treat it, uh, a watering of clear water wouldn't harm your plant. Okay. What about in commercial production, if, if you've treated for any of these diseases? Um, in commercial production, if you were able to apply a fungicide and, and it would actually kill, and it was in the early enough stages, you could, uh, you could do that as well. You could have a watering period and then transition back to a fertigation period. Um, but again, it's important to identify the root cause of that. And if your plants are too far along, um, to go ahead and pull those plants. Likewise, if you know, if it is pythium or if it is uh, a water mold or something that's transitioned uh, or being able to be uh, transferred by splashing, make sure how you're watering. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're not getting a whole lot of splashing. That could help. Uh, but if it's in a commercial setting, chances are they're going to probably still be spores in that area. So you're going to need to really monitor your crop. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, um, Nathan. We're, we're out of time. And anyone who has asked a question and we couldn't get to your question, we, we have your email and um, the folks at Premier Tech can get back to you with your answer. There's a few more out there we weren't able to get to. And you can as email a reminder, me. Okay. Oh, I was going to say they can email me as well if they want. I have my email in the initial PowerPoint if they have any, uh, any questions I wasn't fortunate to get to as well. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, so there is also an on-demand link to this webinar. So if there's part of it you want to go back and, and rewatch or use for your reference, it's, it will be at the same link that you used to get on and register today. And you also get an email tomorrow, um, 24 hours, that will give you that link as well. So you don't have to go back and search for it. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, thank you to Nathan for sure. And thank you to Premier Tech for making this webinar possible. So uh, have a great day. Thank you all.